we're getting organized in the science of science international somewhere. Um, what we're going to do uh, in, in this session is just to talk to you a little bit about a project that India and I are doing. Um, we're, we're making um, a disc, a, a, a modern disc, a CD, um, which is being released as the second um, of a label called Pennine Records, uh, which I sort of set up here at the University of Huddersfield. The purpose of the record is to look at, uh, of the label rather, is to look at various sort of historically interested aspects of performance. Now, I use that deliberately slightly vague term for a reason, which is uh, that I'm, I'm hoping to sort of encourage a whole range of different responses to, uh, I think, what has been billed in terms of this conference as uh, practice-led research. Um, but that may describe my, my esteemed colleague uh, uh, India more than me. I think I'm probably research-led practice. Uh, and increasingly, actually, as time goes on. Uh, so it's an interesting thing. Um, so um, that's what the label is. And what we've been doing is we've been working on the project. We're going to discuss that a little bit with you. And also, there's going to be some practical demonstration as well. Um, this, in the spirit, indeed, of early recordings and uh, the late 19th, 20th century is quite spontaneous and slightly unplanned. Um, so consequently, it may not run absolutely on point, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm just going to grab a music stand, if I may, because I think it's like being skewered. Oh, it's in front of you. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so we started off with some really sort of basic uh, research questions. Um, because I think, I mean, you do, do uh, just sort of dot in at any point, but uh, I mean, we, we've all used recordings, early recordings as sound documents. They're often described as this, as, uh, as primary sources uh, for historical practices. Uh, many years ago, when I did my own PhD, uh, I, I looked at theory and practice, or theory versus practice, or the interrelationship between theory and practice. And to a certain extent, practice uh, was a synonym for early recordings. It, it, in reality, in that a huge amount of information is offered by other recordings. So, um, but that's that, that's on the receiving end. And of course, we're all, as experts, fully aware of the many legion difficulties and limitations of early recordings, not really even worth stating uh, in a context such as this. So what is it like to make a recording? And, you know, the question of why we would even want to do this may not be a relevant question to us in this room, but we have to root ourselves in the real world uh, in which people may well ask that question. Uh, why would we want to do something via technology that uh, certainly in 1925 was, was greatly enhanced by the invention of the and, and, and rapid uh, diffusion of the use of the electric microphone? Uh, the relationship between normal playing and playing on the recording. You know, we know of difficult conditions, uncomfortable conditions, um, short time lengths, difficulties with, with choosing appropriate repertoire, cuts that need to be made to the repertoire, and so on and so on. Uh, and what's it actually like to do this? I was absolutely thrilled uh, when India sort of said, you know, that I could take part in this. Uh, this is literally a lifetime ambition, because having spent 25 years looking at and listening to these recordings to actually make something with one of those one of those technologies, because of course it is not a single one, uh, was an amazing thing. Third point, it's fairly obvious you can obviously read all of these things. Um, um, so the question really is, is are we, you know, if we're looking, if we're aiming to play in this kind of style, if we can, if we can actually make a document like that, if we can make that in a way that is convincing. And actually, on the receiving of the output end, it's convincing. Maybe that, that might validate something about what we're doing. Mm. On the other hand, it might not. I don't know. Do you want to have yes, I, I just wanted to the, like just add a couple of things. Uh, I, I started the whole project because I realized that I can't really fully grasp what am I listening without understanding how this was made. And uh, without not having any idea, uh, I mean, of course, the, the reading the testimonies and reading the documents is one thing, uh, but this uh, feeling of uh, feeling uncomfortable, which you <laughs> so nicely understated, <laughs> because it's more than uncomfortable, which you will all witness. This feeling of being un uncomfortable is very specific uh, to this recording process, and it really, uh, uh, really uh, it was important to me to understand to which level my body is uncomfortable in order and at the same time that I need to produce something which sounds not uncomfortable but relaxed, beautiful, with a ringing tone <laughs> and, and, and things like that. 
These are two very, very uh, opposite things. Uh, so basically, uh, we all know uh, what uh, the public um, uh, interpretations look like, and uh, it, there is always a certain degree of feeling uncomfortable, but not in this way, in a context of being physically, uh, uh, and I, I would use the words tied, uh, in, in order to produce something. So somebody ties you and says, Oh, just be relaxed <laughs> and sing this out. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> uh, so it was for me. It was really uh, interesting artistically to go go through it. When we started doing the project, and I started doing uh, uh, things with wax cylinders, and then later on with discs and seven inch and then ten inch, uh, uh, it was really important to me uh, to to understand the levels of nuance of these uh, uh, mechanical uh, technologies. Using one phonograph was uh, different than using another, and uh, it, it was very uh, detailed. This, this, those differences were re really small, but there were many of them. Um, so I, I, I have to say I'm still learning uh, so much about these machines. Uh, I don't dare to say anything about them because there is always you know, somebody who knows everything about it and how to build one, uh, as Duncan Miller will, will show you later on in the workshop. Um, so it is really a can of worms, and this symposium is really, uh, uh, I wanted it to happen in a way that we, I open the can, and please join me and spread the worms around, <laughs> and let's see, let's see what happens, because that's how we can get this research going in different uh, different routes and uh, understand more about this. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, I came up with these three really simple questions, yeah? Because what are we trying to do? Why are we doing this? And how are we going to actually do it? So, um, what, we, what we're going to talk about, and I think play a little bit, I, I hope reasonably successfully, because it's awfully early on the Sunday morning, but I'll do my best, <laughs> um, is we're going to play a little uh, clip of uh, this uh, Nardini slow movement in Ferdinand David's uh, edition of it, as recorded and uh, was recorded by Arnold Rose uh, in, I think, 1910, possibly the 1909, actually, I may be, I may be wrong there. Um, but um, just, just a sort of few things about that. So, um, what we've got here is, in one sense, we've got two things happening, obviously. One, we're actually, as, as, as 21st century musicians, we are making a, a recording using an antiquated technology. Um, secondly, we are we are simultaneously enacting some form of what one might call emulation. Now, of course, this word, rather like the word embodiment, um, has taken on a life of its own and become awfully specialised these days. And I I hesitate uh, to to stray where I'm I'm not invited in terms of the specific research of this. Um, but but you know what what we're trying to do is is in one sense to a certain degree anyway to evoke something of this style of performance. So. Um, you know, I hope that the other uh, the things are in here, and therefore I can play a little clip of this. Yes, you can. Um, so um, this is this is Rose. <laughs> we'll see if this works. Conservatory. Uh, in 1879, at the age of 16, uh, Massard described his play as very beautiful, but without perfume, uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of uh, rough paraphrase, uh, which I think is probably to do um, with a, a rather aesthetic kind of approach to sound, which 
uh, has um, resulted in a lot of people, me included, many years ago, certainly, comparing his playing to that of Josef Joachim, um, whose 1903 recordings are probably some of the most famous and important recordings ever made of anything, really. Um, there are significant differences between Rosé and Joachim. Um, I think there are significant, um, how do I put this, um, intellectual and temperamental differences between the two violinists. Um, and, and there are certainly certain kind of traits of style that we can recognise. Obviously, uh, there is plenty of portamento. Uh, most of it um, is of the so-called B portamento type, where you fly up and sort of land, but not all of it. Um, there is evidence of him using various other slightly more constructive portamenti, uh, including from open strings to fingered notes, as described, for example, in Charles de Berio's uh, treatise, uh, Metal de Violon of 1858, there is a famous example, I forget the page number off the top of my head, uh, but there is an example there in which he does almost exactly the same kind of thing. Um, and also uh, the so-called uh, El Portamento occasionally comes in, uh, single fingers, like all of this kind of stuff. And, and they are very, very um, idiosyncratic. Yeah, his portamenti are fast uh, and quite an accentual uh, in a way that I think is absolutely unique. Um, so we, we've got that. We've got a specific kind of agenda to try and evoke um, in terms of uh, what we're trying to do when we're playing it. Uh, but there's also the sort of general sound world. There are aspects of tempo, flexibility and freedom and so forth as well. Um, now, of course, any act of emulation may or may not be a, a, a sort of literal copy or, or not. You may be aiming scientifically to replicate exactly what we're hearing, <laughs> or you may not. You may decide that that is a style, it's a particular culture that you're trying to uh, get into. Uh, and to be perfectly honest, that second category is much more my kind of thing, because pragmatically, you know, we are very different violinists at different times. Uh, and, you know, the idea of one person trying to be like another one um, is, is, is sort of rather like Elvis Presley impersonation. It has artistic limitations, shall we say. Um, so what I was trying to do here, what we did try and do, is to replicate that kind of sound world, uh, in particular in terms of things like flexibility of tempo, rhythms, all of those kind of things. Um, so we have a number of these things. I mean, we have a, an entire programme, um, and hopefully this this in the year is going to be out by the end of this calendar year, yeah. and that's what we're hoping for. Um, but what we do is just explore this particular example a little bit. So um, we've got those, those are the kind of questions here. I mean, you've hopefully been reading that whilst I've been sort of talking a little bit about it, uh, and they're fairly self-explanatory, I think. Inu, do you want to come in there, or shall I go to the next slide? I think just go to the next. Then okay. We'll so, uh, repertoire selections, in terms of putting a disc together, was a key thing. I mean, we ended up with 10-inch with discs, didn't we, yes. I think, for this project, which obviously reduces the length to, correct me if I'm wrong, three minutes, absolutely. It's three minutes maximum. and maybe a little bit uh, added, 10 seconds. Yeah, <laughs> rather dangerously, yeah, if so. Dangerous. <laughs> um, now, that's quite, that's quite a lot shorter than, than some of the target sound documents that we're looking at, yes. which are likely to be 12-inch discs with yes. a sort of four-minute-plus yeah. length. So in some cases, what we did, the first obvious departure in some of it in particular is that we made our own cuts. So in terms of a, of a kind of artistic research-led practice, we were having to do the things that they did 120 years ago uh, because we're doing the same thing. So we had to yeah. make exactly the same, you know, uh, and in fact, only the other day when we were preparing this, we were thinking about, you know, we were not got enough time for this. You know, can we cut this bit of info? No, that doesn't work. You know, we, we need to find a way of replicating the harmonic structure without some sort of ghastly yeah. sort of, you know, clutchless gear change, so to speak. Um, so we, these are practical issues that we had. How to practice for the acoustic session. Uh, was, as I say, it's a completely new experience for me. Uh, and you've already done quite a lot yes. by the time you uh, got to this. Yes, that is true. It's it's really weird. I, I always tried not to practice for it. I tried to practice just practicing in general, <laughs> yeah? And then I don't want to uh, influence my interpretation by playing it out as I need I would need for acoustic uh, recording. But what always happens that I always try it out. And uh, I because... Uh, uh, there is one specific reason why I do that. I try out uh, playing everything, as you, you, we will show you now, uh, everything needs to be played much louder than you would expect, uh, which will then change the, uh, the, the natural uh, flow of the phrase. Uh, it will change my positioning of the, of the hands because piano hands are not the same. Uh, it, it's completely not the same if you're playing piano or forte 
there is a different type of strain in the hands, which is kind of normal <laughs> because you're using your muscles more. So, uh, so it is like that. Um, so uh, I end up, uh, I don't want to practice for acoustic recording because you never know what is going to happen in the context of, like for instance, temperature in the room will be maybe a little bit higher than you don't need to play that loud, loudly uh, because it will be easier to cut the wax. And then I just don't want to go into that momentum of uh, being out. This is how I play. And th this is how, th that's the only way I can mm. play. So yeah. I kind of try to, try to do it. Um, uh, but there are ways of preparing and preparing is, uh, just uh, working very closely with uh, a, a stopwatch, <laughs> which is really important. Um, and yes, uh, using the, the, I use this piano, this David's instrument, uh, when I have to record, I use it for days to get used to it. Um, because uh, as with every, every early 20th century piano, every key has a life of its own and it's quite difficult to yeah, kind of gra <laughs> grasp, yeah? Uh, so, uh, did you prepare any different? Um, well, um, I mean, it depends. I mean, you say that you didn't practice. I mean, I see the word practice as a synonym for preparation, uh, as I say to all of my students. Um, and that's the general way that I meant it. I, I, I was worried about, I mean, I, I think one of the things that's interesting about this, of course, is that we, we know a lot about how they did it before we started. So yeah. one shouldn't be disingenuous about this. Uh, obviously, although I've not done this before, I, I you know, I'm aware of what the issues were, because I'm almost tempted to say, actually, uh, uh, cr creating um, sort of, you know, <laughs> publicity for the problems. Uh, there is perhaps something of an agenda um, uh, behind some who, shall we say, like to uh, uh, make more of the difficulties than perhaps uh, might possibly exist. I don't think it's a, it's a very um, you know, neutral territory. Uh, but no, in terms of my preparation, it was, it was very, very basic, really. Uh, I wanted to make sure I didn't bang into anything. So I practiced sitting in a corner um, where I couldn't move very much. And that, that does, it's a bit like what Annie was saying in terms of, of, of key stuff, that that is a very different way of playing uh, because you cannot be absolutely free, exactly, uh, with, uh, with one's bowing. I've just demonstrated that rather well because you tend to bang into things. Um, and, so, and so there is a sort of sense of how much space is there available and how can you actually create sound and i think one of the things as well is how does one to use a dreadful made up um 21st century word how does one uh, perform expressivity uh, in these conditions because quite clearly there are going to be uh, some attenuations of what one could do say in front of an electric microphone or the highly sensitive uh, 21st century equipment that we have um, so obviously that means you know doing other things more and i think i think it's very important to think about this because um, it very much depends what one's experience is as a musician uh, and what those experiences are like um, if one plays in a concert hall all the time and receives you know very large fees uh, and is sort of very carefully cared for by the 21st century dare i even say a sort of modern, modernist paradigm of performance, and I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying that later on, um, uh, then, then perhaps the contrast is massive. If, on the other hand, like me, you sort of do a bit of everything, um, and, you know, you sit in a pit band one day, and then you might, you know, play string quartets, and then you might do anything, really. Uh, it's just, again, it's one of, one of the sort of rich tapestry of experiences one has, and I think that's important. Robert Phillip makes uh, a, a lot of mention of these ecological points so to speak, uh, in his 2004 text. Um, some have, have suggested that this was less evidentially based than his 1992 te uh, text. Um, I'm not sure. I actually find it really, really interesting the way that he explores the, the kind of environmental aspects of being a musician in the early 20th century when recordings were being made, when a musician would you know, go, go between playing in the cinema or orchestra one day and, and, and playing uh, a proper classical symphony, another one. Uh, and so on and so forth. So I think it's those kind of things. Um, organologically, I mean, yeah, we, we've used this, this little um, 1910, uh, probably 1910 Broadwood Upright, um, which, which I own as a slightly surplus to requirement and has <laughs> gained a new life on this project, really. <laughs> yeah. uh, and um, my own instrument, uh, strung, of course, with, with, with gut strings as appropriate to this kind of period, uh, you know, thick gut strings as well. Um, uh, they're a little bit of a hotspot this morning, I'm afraid, for dull reasons like difficulties of actually getting people to deliver things in this post 
Brexit world. Um, but, um, you know, we'll see how we get on. Um, so that's basically that. I think we ought to do some playing, actually. Yeah, uh, but yeah. I... Um... I want to, before we play, could I... Can uh, I get my fiddle ready whilst you're talking? Yes, can I, can I play our record? Uh, yes, this? Okay. So, uh, there is a big difference for me always to listen to these uh, cylinders uh, on these machines and to listen to the transfers. Really, really huge. And uh, when I can, of course, I strive to, to listen to it on the original. Uh, original uh, technologies. Uh, why? Because uh, uh, it's it just uh, the background noise, it's not so obvious and it, it really does have an atmosphere and uh, I don't know, um, there is something also very romantic in preparation of this and making sure that everything works and then you put a new needle because every time you play a disc you have to put a new needle on. And if there is just this, um, I don't know, like preparing coffee <laughs> uh, kind of uh, order of things. So uh, I wanted to play you the, the actual disc we made because we, we have a few. Um, and, uh, and then we will uh, show you what kind of mimic what we had to do in order to do this disc, produce this disc. And then uh, uh, the, after that, we'll talk you through our understanding how this uh, experimental role of experiencing these research, uh, research and recording sessions, uh, how that influenced us for the future um, uh, performances and how is that related. Because playing for a, a recording funnel, for a recording hall, a horn, is not the same as playing in a hall and now what do we take from that? And how do we put one context to another? Which is very subjective, I do. We, we both do agree with that, so. Uh, and I'll just show you this. So it's the same piece, yeah? This is the first time I've heard this.
Sorry about the <laughs> initial glitch. Uh, so yes, this is the end result. Uh, would you like to show them what we, we have to do in order to get that? So do you want to do this? Is, this is sort of like when we like were show and tell. Yeah, <laughs> show and tell. Where should I be? I don't know where yeah. the cameras are. Like, oh, okay. No, you should be you where, where, where you yeah, sat. Right. When. <laughs> so here's the thing. Uh, so we have obviously phonograph uh, uh, equipment here, but it's very similar when when we did the disc. Uh, the equipment was here, and the basically the funnel was in. David's face. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and well, there's so, some photographs, I think, on here, yeah. unless they've disappeared now. Are they still there? Yeah, yeah, no, they're yeah, here. We'll, we'll show you. Actually, just go ahead to those if you don't mind, because yeah. uh, we can we can skip through some of this kind of stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't look very happy. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, or me. So, yeah, just, can I just say with that one that we started off, and um, this is the first session, uh, we started off with two horns, didn't we? Yes. Um, and, then, and then in the later one, as you'll see, uh, we, we decided through experimentation that actually one horn was probably more likely. Um, so, so you'll see that in the later series. So you can see how close, and there's, there's very little room. Yeah. To so with two horns, you can hear piano much clearer. Uh, and once you do a recording with two horns and then one horn, you start realizing which recordings you're listening to were done with one horn and which one was with, with one. There is, uh, it's not about the dynamics of somebody's playing, it's how, how, how this sound was inputted in the, in the, in the cylinder. The balance, it's, yeah, it? it's yeah. the balance. Yeah. Um, so we did this and uh, honestly, it didn't really match for this early stuff because mm -hmm. I think that they actually did it more with one horn mm -hmm. than with two until later on. Um, so this is the uncomfortable thing what David was saying. Yeah. And <laughs> can, can, I, can I just interject there and say, I mean, one, one of the things, uh, I mean, I, I don't do a huge amount of, of, of modern recording, but I do some. And of course, with that, you know, all responsibility is ceded from you as a player, or a lot of it is anyway. You know, there's somebody in the control room, you know, telling you to play your F sharps in tune. And there's all that kind of stuff. And basically, because of the fantastic sensitivity of the equipment, um, you know, it's all about that. Whereas with this, you are you are the, the producer and you have to do it yourself. So, you know, you have to find, it's a little bit like teaching on Zoom, he said with passion. Um, you know, you have to find a way. I mean, I play on Zoom in a way that I play doing this kind of thing in order that everything is really clear. Um, so I think that was a really profound difference. And in a funny kind of way, that therefore suggests an irony here, which is that we have more control over the end product, arguably. Than we might do with modern recording. Anyway, I just thought I did. Sorry. Yeah, and and also because it's always one take. Yeah, yeah. I mean that oh, makes yeah. a difference. It it makes it makes me very nervous because uh, I think that uh, playing in front of the audience, it's always much more forgiving. People are very happy to be on a concert. So if you play a a wrong note, it's not really such a big deal. It's about delivering the whole. <laughs> the whole atmosphere and experience and it's never about these little details but when you listen to the record to the disc it is because everybody is listening in a different way and it's i think it's uh, it's ner uh, it's actually making this recording as in one take is more nerve-wracking for me than playing live concert i don't know why uh, because also I, as you said you are in a role of producer. You can allow it if it's going to, if you are going to share it with colleagues or not. But kind of you know what you did, <laughs> and I you think, can't sleep at night. <laughs> I think the other thing as well, of course, is that is that you've got no control over anything. <laughs> um, so you know you could get at the end of this, and, and and Duncan might say, "Oh, we can't do that." You know, there's there's too much wax wharf building up, or there's a bubble in the thing, or whatever. Um, so and of course you, we don't get to hear it. We can't go into the control room and have a listen back, you know. And I didn't hear this for weeks uh, afterwards. And that, then that was an electronic file through my computer sound system. This is the first time I've heard it as a as a physical disc this morning, uh, which is quite an odd experience, I can tell you. Um, but yeah, I think that element is also so. So yeah, here you can see this is our second uh, COVID session. Hence, I'm wearing a mask, uh, and and you can sort of see there that we're just using the one. And that that seemed to be that that's what you heard. That was the session. Um, of which you heard that recording. Yeah. This is how much we wanted to do this. We actually put this piano from the university where we were not allowed to meet to the 
my house, which is this on the yes. photo, where we were allowed to meet because we were doing work. So at that sense. time, we were allowed to meet in our house. So, yes. so, so we all did work in my house and paid for the piano to be delivered to, to, to Sheffield, where I live. Uh, so yes, <laughs> and did an improvised studio in my living room. Um, so this is how it, uh, it all looked like. Um, <laughs> Uh, as you can see, he does, the David doesn't have a score. You had something, you know, far, far away. I, I, had, I had a score, but it was sort of big and miles away. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not, my memory isn't good enough for this kind of thing if I don't have a piece of paper. So uh, that, that's what I did. And it would appear that I'm wearing exactly the same waistcoat. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, the, we have electronic transfer, uh, but we, we, we just uh, played you. Some time, we can leave that. Yeah, yeah. No, we, it's, so it's, what we're going to do? We're going to try so and play we want a little to, bit like we did, just a little bit. Okay. And uh, notice one really important thing. Okay, in certain. Uh, uh, so uh, David was sitting for one really, really simple reason. Uh, we didn't have legs high enough to put the machine on. Okay, <laughs> so it's very, very simple. But in context of when I recorded with Kate, uh, yeah, uh, obviously cellists need to sit. So th this was a usual. I think when people have to sit, so it's not unusual for a violinist to sit down. I mean, uh, it is fine. Because he was sitting, there was no chamber communication whatsoever. It was one, two, three, and we go and we meet at the end. And uh, this gave a lot of freedom, actually, and a lot of stress, I think, <laughs> from both of our... Um, and you have to notice another thing, which I believe is very, very uncomfortable. I had to play quite loudly, as I said, because we are doing doing with one horn. He's sitting just next in, with a head in in the sound box, <laughs> Thanks, which I yes, think yes. that is really horrible, especially because I'm really how we would say in piano world, banging yes. <laughs> the piano, like was, really hard. So it's it, it was extraordinary. Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. So you really will witness nice. that. Uh, we'll um, not do it for too long, <laughs> so um, <laughs> we can do do it either. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, I think, oh, no, it's gone past then. And also we would both have to start playing when Duncan told us, not when we wanted to start. So we would, sitting, we would be sitting here and then man would raise his hand and then you go. I'll try uh, and replicate vaguely what I was doing. So I, I was sort of teaching slightly to the side and I got the bell sort of here. Now, so, obviously, this means that string crossings that way are quite exciting. So, yeah, you, you end up actually lowering the elbow and it, it's somewhat in the in this sort of old Germanic manner because otherwise you end up hitting things. But shall we just try? So this is sort of what we did. And I think what, what, what my, my thought was... Um, because I think this is what they did anyway, is that I will I will try and make as much as I can of, of, of variations of tempo and rhythm and so on in order to create expressivity that way. Dare I say, rather as a, a, as a pipe organist might do, if you know if you can't, well, you can you can change registration, of course, but articulation, tempo, shaping is almost entirely through that. It's, it's much less through dynamic shaping. That was my experience anyway. Should we try? Yes, should we do like first eight bars or something? Uh, right? Oh, a little bit more than that, maybe. More? Okay. Yeah, Are you just stop, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's go.
so <laughs> that's sort of what we have to do. And I can't, I can't hear my own playing, really, because this is really loud. Um, but the thing with that, of course, because there's no communication, what, what, because, I mean, this is, I mean, sorry, it is, I mean, it's, 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 this is the, this is the virtuoso violinist with unnamed pianist, 19.5, you know, <laughs> but this particular one, this isn't the others are not. Used to <laughs> so, so from that point of view, I am leading in a very sort of 19th century, in the sense that I'm just trying to dictate what we're doing uh, through slightly anticipating. So, I'm not saying that this is the reason why bar lines are anticipated a lot in early recordings. That would be a daft thing to say, because I think it's much more profound than that. But I do think that it gives a greater incentive to some of the very recognisable traits that one observes in early recordings. I think they are encouraged by the process. And that was one of the really interesting things that I found out actually having the opportunity to do it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I would just add also that it's really, for me, it was really important to, um, you know, to hear the end product. Uh, you heard that I was not louder than David in any point on this disc, I hope, uh, uh, but I was not overwhelmingly loud at all. Uh, the fact that the horn is on him, yeah, and that I'm outside of that range, just means that, that there is this, this beautiful difference between the in instruments and that the piano is kind of supporting the violin, being quite quiet, yeah? Well, while it's obvious, as you could hear, that that was not the case. If I played like this in the concert hall, you would think that I'm completely nuts. I'm like, who does that? <laughs> yeah, it's completely overbearing. Uh, so uh, we wanted to show you what this taught us, yeah? Uh, Going into extreme conditions um, and putting yourself in the uh, in the condition of mechanical recording session uh, makes you, for me personally, made me understand um, how much of expressional techniques I actually want to use when I'm playing live. I do. I did notice that I'm using more expressional techniques as this location and metric rubato when I was recording, because that was my mean of expression. Uh, yeah. Once I don't record and I just need to play, I would actually uh, do my mix and match, and it was substantially smaller amount, and it was more straight playing in, in that regard. However, the uh, uh, I would take more time, which I couldn't do, in the mechanical recording session because of the timing uh, limitation. So I would be f more free with rubato in general. So we just wanted to play this through as we would play it if we just actually played it today. Uh, is there any way of switching this one off? Oh, it's, yes, oh. this. Uh, uh, I don't think we're going to manage that to be honest in the time. Right. It's more complicated than one might imagine. <laughs> So shall I shall I come out here? Oh, okay. yeah. I'll come here perhaps so we can actually see each other. Oh. <laughs> and I can stand up. Yes. A great luxury. So so the idea is to play this in a slightly just, more normal way. Yeah, it? just okay. like we did. For fun. <laughs>
So yeah, I mean, um, it, it's it's a curious experience really because um, yeah, there, there are certain freedoms that it, 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 it's a very different experience sort of doing that. And I mm. think I think what one has more. I mean, I, I, in my recent monograph, I, I sort of try try and sell the idea of nineteenth-century performance in a handbook uh, uh, aimed at uh, not at such great. Uh, people as yourselves with your in-depth knowledge of scholarship, because you know already, uh, but rather to try and try and infuse people uh, into aspects of 19th and early 20th century performing practices, because I think it's really fascinating and great fun, apart from anything else, and indeed very appropriate in, in many other ways. Uh, but one of the things that I talk about is it's sort of, you know, everything is, is potentially an expressive possibility. Uh, you know, we don't have this, this, this sort of, we, we, we draw lines in different places. I won't say that, that people in the 20th century, 21st century play exactly what it says on the page, because that is impossible and patently untrue, uh, and a great disservice to many of my great colleagues who are not interested in historical performance. But at the same time, it is also true to say uh, that those lines, lines are drawn in very different places, um, and that there is more, there are more things that one, one tends to explore more, <laughs> uh, perhaps to, to a greater degree, Echelorandi and, and so on and so forth. Obviously, the recording process, I think, can tend to, uh, um, I, not exaggerate, but it tends to draw certain elements of that out, perhaps yeah. more than others. Yeah. And I think, so, so I think that's the thing. So you end up, it almost becomes more complicated yes. than just doing that. It felt more complicated to yes. do that than it did down there because I thought, well, well I need, I've now got the opportunity to do this. What shall I do with dynamics? <laughs> uh, and actually I found that a more disconcerting experience for you this morning than it was sitting in that chair. So yeah. it's a curious thing. Yeah. Anyway. Well, that's it. It yes, that, that's, that's all from us. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, yes, I'll be nice this a slightly random place. Yes. I don't think there's anything else particular. I don't know what the time is. Uh, it's 3 to 10. It's 3 to 10. Wow. So we have three minutes to uh, for some questions. Um, if somebody has a question. I'll keep an eye on Okay, super. Yes. Really interesting about what you were saying about that post light um, and certain instruments coming to the fore as a result of that. Thinking about does the wax recording favour certain timbres, certain instruments? Um, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of what you've all grown up with um, vinyl recordings and then moving on to CD digital recordings, and there is a view out there that. Okay. I don't know how romantic it is. So the, the things which record the best are the voice and the violin. And uh, so the things which you can actually approach to the funnel. So it's not about the wax, it's about coming to the recording form. Uh, because obviously uh, you can kind of go really, really close. While I have such a big soundboard that uh, it's very difficult. So when you put uh, a, a funnel to the piano, then it records certain things more, better than, uh, than the others. Uh, the phonograph, I wrote about that uh, because we did some measurements. The phonograph doesn't uh, catch easily bass notes. Uh, and, uh, and it kind of catches the middle range, the best, and then the, the high-pitched notes also are not so well. So the, it's limited, but it's not as limited as one would think. So all the bass notes you would hear on this disc uh, so, which is uh, you know different machinery, but not so far away from it. Um, uh, it did record the bass. I just need to play it in the way how I played it. If I didn't play the bass so loudly as I showed that I really sat on every bass note, yeah, then you would not be able to hear it that much. Would that guide the repertoire that you choose to record? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, the repertoire for sure and then you can actually start seeing that there are some some people who recorded more successfully than the others yeah and it sounds different yeah thank you you're welcome yes george no there's nothing big. okay yeah, but we need to go okay no just just to uh, a small point um the those wonderful 19th century or late 19th century editions of the repertory play. All, all the stuff I learned when I was a kid was piano parts with massive octaves all over the place. Yes. You know, yeah. That clearly works for this. Yes. You know, it does. In a way that something yeah. a bit more 
I mean, I think uh, think of uh, editions of Buzoni for Bach. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it yeah. always says octaves in the bass. Yeah. And I love playing from those editions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have anything to do with Baroque, but it's fantastic. And yeah? it's, it's yeah. really good. So you should record that. <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank you. Hey, I'll ask a final question. Yes. So I, I was wondering, it was maybe a bit about repertoire choices, and it, it strikes me that, you know, like what you play here is not Chopin or Brahms or what we would normally focus on, but it's it's something quite typical of the time, mm -hmm. and sentimental as well. You know, it's the kind of thing that we perhaps, not that we wouldn't take it seriously, but, you know, I think we don't look at that kind of repertoire in the same way as we look at Brahms or, or yeah. whoever. So, I mean, what's that part of your preparation as well? You know, try to kind of get more attuned to this kind of expressive language that maybe it wasn't part of your, of your training, it wasn't part of what you normally do. Uh, for me, it was different in a way that uh, I think that the, you can see a trace in the early recording artists, which is the same case what you have nowadays with recording artists, that certain people profile for certain type of music. And there are the people who are virtuosic uh, in the context of piano playing. And they will just play virtuosic music all the time, and it's fantastic, like uh, Amla, yeah? He, is, he just really plays all the time, like su such incredibly difficult music to play. Um, and he kind of, I think, profiled himself in that in way, but then you have people who profile only in Bach and, and stuff like that. So you could see that uh, in viol violinists, for instance, a good uh, example is Sarasate, because Sarasate is actually doing his uh, his music all the time, uh, and uh, which is very, very virtuosic, which is different than what mm -hmm. Misha Elman was doing, or uh, the Rose and, and stuff like that. But repertoires <laughs> are different, and there is this kind of uh, a middle ground of the music which I didn't know, where I had to Google, who is that? <laughs> who is that? When did they, which era am I playing? And also, I mean, Nadine is a Baroque composer, yeah? How is this, how is this written? I mean, it's not written as a Baroque accompaniment. It's completely romanticized. Yeah, so I'm playing it in a romantic I'm way. I'm not playing it in a heart. No, yes, exactly. But <laughs> I say not... all the ABRSM editions. <laughs> yeah. Give, give somebody on a nasty Kawaii piano somewhere a harpsichord part. I'd much rather than have them. Yeah. Yeah. In the piano. Yeah. In fact, this thing that you shouldn't use the pedal on the piano. Yeah. If I could just interject that, I think the thing that that, that the profound thing is generally speaking, violinists played the way they played. They didn't necessarily play the music differently. So, you know, in the sense that, um, you know, now we live in an age in which we are increasingly aware of different performing practices for different epochs and different composers. And we become, you know, e e even, I mean, that's a dreadful word to use, even in the real world, people are aware of, of, of these things, uh, at least with classical music. Uh, with, with romantic music, as any of us who are on the hapless uh, receiving end of ABRSM examiners' conference will know, all sorts of daft things are still promulgated, it would appear, uh, about what you're supposed to do. You know, you have to use lots of vibrato in Chambaberio, uh, for example, you know, doesn't really, clearly hasn't read the Meton de Violon, uh, as I said in my letter to the ABRSM only recently. Um, but I think, I think the fact that, we, that, that, that they tended to play this you know, different repertoire more or less in the same way, I think this Nardini, for example, bits of that sounds like four when you play it like that. And in fact, you know, I got really was struck with that, with that, that it could easily be a, a four slow movement. Um, so yeah, but I, I think yeah, I think I think that, that you know it was an entertainment technology, wasn't it initially? Um, it was not taken desperately seriously, except by a few. I mean, I think it's astonishing that people, you know, in my own world, like Joachim, as early as 1903, uh, would have taken it seriously enough to have actually performed and actually given us an oral record at all, because you know it was not. I don't think. I think he did have a sense of legacy, which is very clear from his editorial contributions as well. So perhaps it was a bit of an exception in that case. But yeah, I mean, I think, uh, just to finish with that, my, my, when I was learning the violin, I mean, you know, I don't come from a very sort of effete uh, artistic cultural family at all or anything really. I'm just a, a chap from the north of England. And my grandfather played the violin 
um, uh, in the 19, he learned from Spohr's method instead, he copied his line inherited in the 1930s. Um, and uh, his idea of repertoire was this kind of stuff. We had books and books and books of these kinds of things, you know, little opera, opera arias, transcribed for piano and violin, you name it, Rubenstein's Melody in F, you know, Raph oh, yeah. <laughs> this kind of, I was brought up on that kind of stuff and I gradually became slightly more sophisticated when I started playing chamber music in my early teens and start, you know, Beethoven and Haydn became the thing. And of course, you know, that's lost to history now. So for me, I don't really have any problem with this kind of thing at all. Uh, but I think, yeah, it is a very, very different repertory and it's a very, very different relationship with that, both psychologically and also performatively in terms of performing practices. Sorry. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.